Hi, Prague. Hello. Let's get this started. So I don't know if any of you was at Aliscom 2016, because I brought the uh, saxophone M&Ms playing a robot there, and had it on stage, and God, that was hard to get through security. <laughs> My original plan was um, to do a kind of a gentle introduction to nerves, uh, to a lot of people who didn't know about it, and uh, but then found out that Justin was keynoting just before me, so I had to change the plans of what I was talking about, so I made it all about OTP, ooh, shouting, made it all about OTP and mapping to, pro how great it is to have processes and mapping to sensors and actuators and that kind of thing, how it's such a, a natural fit. Since then, we've done kind of fun things for um, uh, various, whoa, sound, for various conferences. We had a front end on a Raspberry Pi for a Marty robot. We had battling uh, um, robots with laser tag and light sensors. But a fairly, I don't know, something like a fairly mainstream use we found for it was uh, as an office camera. So we have remote people, and remote people come in and they go, hey, can you help me with this problem? And they get no answer on Slack, and they've got no idea what's going on. Uh, and it's because everyone's got, uh, popped out for get a coffee or go out for lunch, so they can have a, a look on the camera and see what's going on in the office and understand why, why uh, nobody's answering them. It's got other uses, like for instance, if you've got one just lying around and you need to change the brake light on the family car, um, you can stick it to a wheelie bin and uh, and check if the brake light's working or not while you're uh, while you're in the front seat. Um, it's uh, much easier than putting a brick, obviously, because I couldn't find a brick. Um, <laughs> Basic architecture, because it's a, it's a Pi cam, it's streaming images from the Raspberry Pi, but it's on a local network, so you don't want to be tunneling into a local network to do that. So how it works is we're using web, web sockets to push images up to a server in um, DigitalOcean, and then web sockets down to, um, to a browser, some of these you know, authenticated users signed in, and can, uh, I can see a stream of what's going on in the two office cameras. So, Elixir web sockets, what's good for working with Elixir web sockets? Anyone? No one? That's right, it's cowboy. Um, it's, a lot of people jump, uh, there's a kind of a, a tendency to jump and think, Elixir, WebSockets, we'll use Phoenix Channels, but uh, Phoenix Channels so far are a great abstraction over WebSockets, and they're good for multi multiplexing different topics, but they only support text, um, uh, uh, text uh, frames on WebSockets, and the WebSocket protocol supports binary images, and if you're sending text frames uh, from a camera, A, it will fail. Yeah, you can base 64 encode it, but it's much bigger. You get really jittery images. Um, but it's, it's actually pretty straightforward to use just Cowboy and uh, uh, straight. So the, on the server, we've got Cowboy and Plug as a separate image server in the umbrella, which I like. Um, and a Phoenix application serving up uh, the actual user interface. Uh, it works pretty well. They're on different ports, but they're uh, over NGINX, and you can, you can map over uh, uh, the, S the SSL from the NGINX to the different ports on the server. Uh, just quickly, how that tends to work. Image, there's, um, uh, on the image server application, uh, I'm using plug, because I can't figure out how to do it, it's straight cowboy. Um, <laughs> um, we notice we set the plug to nil because we're going to bypass that and pick up the cowboy, op cowboy options. Cowboy options are like the standard stuff, like port, things like that, the season configuration. And the other thing we put is a dispatch. And dispatch for cowboy is the router. And it looks a bit like this. So we've got two web sockets uh, on there. There's, uh, this one is the brings the images up from the camera. There's uh, 
a camera ID, so we've got to know which camera it is. Uh, in the middle of there's a camera token. That's just a, a little bit of extra security to stop uh, some rando connecting and pushing up random stuff. It's a shared secret between the two. Interested in uh, finding out about the client certificates at some point, because that would be maybe a good use for that. Uh, and then another one which uh, uh, the browser connects to, it's got a authentication to token to show that the user signed in and the camera ID that the user is interested in watching. Uh, the WebSocket handler for Cowboy, pretty straightforward. You need to provide an init function uh, in though it's getting the camera ID out of the bindings and then we're going to put it in the in the state for the WebSocket. Uh, and you return Cowboy WebSocket to upgrade the connection to WebSocket. Then uh, then the image comes up on a, uh, just a, the, the WebSocket handle. The image server image received, that's just um, a, uh, a broadcast event broadcaster. I think it's, yeah, I'm using Phoenix um, uh, PG sub to broadcast events to anybody interested, which in this case is going to be the uh, the browser, any browser website handler. So there'll be one of these uh, web per um, per per um, per connection. Uh, it's a very similar setup. There's just a bit of extra stuff for just to authenticate the user, uh, and then an extra callback which takes place in the WebSocket process, uh, WebSocket init, which enables to us to subscribe to the uh, uh, the notifications that images have come in. Then the messages come through on an image received uh, uh, on the WebSocket WebSocket info image received message comes in. And if you reply to WebSocket info, uh, slightly counterintuitive. If you reply to info, uh, you, the reply sends the message down the WebSocket to the to the user. So easy. Uh, just uh, just for completion, just to show you just how easy the JavaScript is at this point. This is the JavaScript to connect to the binary WebSocket. Um, grab the URL for the WebSocket from the DOM, which the Buffedix has conveniently put in there. And new WebSocket with the URL is all you need. You've got a WebSocket. On message, uh, when, it, when each message comes in, um, you can you take the data, which is an image, create object URL, and uh, replace the source, and then that's it. You're you're, you're streaming. Connection is pretty straightforward. Just put in something in there to check every five seconds uh, uh, to make sure the connection's up and reconnect if it's not up. On the nurse side of things, um, just going to use the Jeremy Yong WebSocket client. Uh, create a, a handler for the WebSocket client. Uh, build up. What we're going to need is we're going to grab the host name because the host name is uh, unique for Raspberry Pi so per board, so we can use that as identifier. Um, the uh, socket URL is configured, yeah, yeah, yeah. Full URL, um, to get a camera token, which is the shared secret we talked about earlier. And then start, let's start the WebSocket client link. Call back, um, and we'll send the next, which send a message to the WebSocket, because the init takes place in the WebSocket process, uh, for a net, net send next frame message, not just in the camera token, and um, very, very similar to the server side. Um, just reply binary. It's a binary, not a text one. The next frame from the camera, and then get that gets shoved up to the server. The server sends um, an acknowledgement that the message has been received. Uh, so when that happens, we'll ping ourselves to send uh, send another frame. That way that we're not sending lots and lots of frames up to the server that it's not coping with because the network's down. We're just doing it at, at a sustainable pace. So in summary, connect to the WebSocket, grab the next frame, send it up. The server probably broadcasts, broadcasts it to anybody watching, acknowledges, and then loop. Quite a bit of code, though, and there's more code coming, so just take a second to 
breathe and look at some pandas. Oh no, panda fell down. Nice thing, but is it production quality? Well, kind of had this thing where we'd, we'd be on for a bit and it'd be on for a couple of days or even a couple of hours or a couple of weeks. And when the office network was up and down a bit, it would drop and it wouldn't reconnect. And uh, look, I actually tore, tore my hair out, you can, you can tell. Um, so, which is disappointing with the Erlang system that I wrote, well, a beam system that I wrote. I mean, it should be self-healing, shouldn't it? So what do, we, what do we need to do to actually get this to a higher quality level where it's a self-healing system? And what we need is the onion of robustness. I found this onion in the bottom of the vegetable drawer. Um, and it was the onion of robustness, and I chopped it open. And I found that it was an onion with layers, which is like most onions, really. In the center of the onion, it had correctness. Does the code do what you expect it to do? And then various levels of one color robustness. Does detecting failure, shutting down, restarting in a good known state at uh, well, the process level, at multiple process level, and at the top at the device level, if it's Absolutely, gumped, just reboot, well, let's, let's reboot the device. And around the outside, there's the monitoring. Um, so at least we get alerted if something's not working, maybe. And also, the monitoring will help us diagnose any issues that we have. Let's dive, in, dive into that a bit. Correctness, does the code do what I think it does? A few things can help us with that. And one is the separation of concerns. I personally like umbrella apps very much. I've heard of ponchos, I kind of don't see the point, but there you go. Um, and of Roller apps, you have a separate application for each major area of the system. Um, there's some stuff in there which I'm going to come to next, but uh, this is the umbrella for the battle bot where you've got little uh, the robots that fire lasers and detect hits and move around and have some kind of game logic. And there's a, there's a kind of a separate bit and a web interface, separate bit for each one of those. And I, find, I find it's easier to test those things in isolation and reason about them uh, when, it, when it's in that kind of configuration. I like umbrellas. So testing, um, I like unit, unit testing. I've been in unit testing for, oh, I don't know, getting on 19 years now. Um, but there is a curve though. So the, you get a lot of benefit from putting effort in early on. Um, but sometimes you get to a point where you're putting loads and loads of effort in and you're not really getting much value yet. You're just, you're, all you're producing is brittle tests or something. So um, depending on your system, it's a medical system, you kind of want to go far to the right, but you know, choose, choose your effort level wisely. And I mostly do, I mostly concentrate on unit testing. And there's a famous set of things from Michael Feathers of, of uh, what a unit test isn't. Uh, so translating that into nerves a little bit. Um, for me, a unit test is something which I run on the host and I don't need a network and I don't need any devices. I can just do mixed test and run it. So to be able to do that on the host, I know the code is at least doing what I expect it to do. You're gonna have to probably fake a bit of hardware. Um, you can avoid a lot of that by pulling co by pulling logic into modules which are side effect free, and you can test those in isolation. But at some point, um, you're probably going to need to fake a bit of hardware. Back in the day, back when we had the saxophone bot, they used to have to fake hardware. I used to do that by conditional compilation because uh, a lot of the stuff wouldn't uh, compile on my Mac. But now, um, nose is. Uh, even super much better, uh, and uh, it'll detect it on a Mac and, uh, and we'll try and compile the stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, another good thing you can do when you're faking stuff up is you can simulate having a fully working system on your machine uh, when you're flying somewhere and you don't have the rest of your stuff with you. Um, some of the libraries you'll, you'll be, well, most of the libraries you're using for um, interacting with um, devices. Uh, 
aren't really that set up for testing, but it's fairly simple just to put in um, an adapter. So here we've got something that's wrapping up the camera access, uh, a, a, a behavior, and there's two things I'm interested in on that. I'm interested in start link to start up the camera and next frame to get the next frame. There's a whole lot of other stuff you can do, but in this device, that's all we're doing. And it's uh, in the real camera, we're just uh, delegated, we're just sending that back, on, back to the PyCam camera. Um, actually, just run back a second if I can. Uh, yeah, just check out the import. That's um, I'm getting the actual implementation from the configuration. Um, bits with on that. It's, you've got to go and look in the file to see what you're doing. I'm thinking actually doing it if mixenv is possibly better in some cases. Uh, then. Uh, the top, the next frame on the, the camera module just goes to whatever the implementation is as the next frame, and in the application when it comes up, it'll do um, either the fake one, which I haven't shown you because it's a bit bigger, or the or the real one if we're on uh, if we're on a production system. So the fake one, uh, it means I can get a a running version of. Ah, went wrong. That should be jumping up and down. I don't know why it's not jumping up and down. Um, which is a little stick man jumping up and down uh, on, uh, on, my, on my host machine uh, with the server running and the, the nerves, well, the actual camera application, the camera nerves umbrella running as separately talking to each other. Weird. Oh, yeah, here we go. Um, <laughs> jumping stick man, worth a wait, eh? Uh, but the main purpose is to be able to do uh, unit tests. I've been using mocks quite a lot, Jose's mocks, but uh, here I'm uh, pushing something into the fake camera implementation where I can push up the next image which is going to come off the stack, uh, which is not an image at all. But um, And then uh, unit testing the WebSocket info. Um, so if it receives a frame, it returns the next image. For instance, there's more fun things you can do, but that's fairly sort of straightforward. Now, next bit, robustness, robustness but on the, uh, the, the smaller, the subsystem level, the process level. Um, if you recall, this is the, the, how the camera's talking to the server, uh, and there's kind of a, there's a, sort of a weakness there of the network. What, what, what if the server doesn't acknowledge uh, what if something goes wrong? What if the WebSocket goes down but the WebSocket library doesn't notice? I'd, I previously was you know, using a WebSocket library which was trying to keep track of state and reconnecting when it went down, and I found that it got lost quite a bit. Um, so I kind of like the let it die thing for these kind of things where if it's not working, just bring it down and bring it back up again. In this case, we're, a good use would, would be like a timeout to say, if we haven't received something in 10 seconds or whatever, let's, uh, we'll, we'll bring the WebSocket down. But we don't have, it's inside the library, the process is closed. So we're gonna create um, a little timer here, which is just a separate gen server. And all it does is it times out. So on init, we'll, we'll time out after 10 seconds. If you call tick, um, you know, time, you know how timeout works, don't you? You call, you, you call a, you send a message, cancel the timeout, call take, cancel the timeout, sets another timeout, ten seconds. Um, so you get a timeout message if take isn't called every at least once every ten seconds, and then it uh, kills itself if it um, if it gets a timeout message. Then we can link the uh, in the init, which takes place in the binary, the, this process. Let's just link the, um, um, let's create a timeout and link it to the WebSocket process. Then every time we see a message received, just call tick. Uh, if we don't receive a message uh, at least once every 10 seconds, WebSocket comes down, brings it back up again. So times out process. WebSocket process, 
Virus socket wrapper, which I mentioned before, which is uh, it creates a web socket and uh, it waits two seconds to create a web socket. In no hurry to create a web socket, it takes off about 30 seconds for the network to come up anyway. And it stops you just thrashing going up and down if the network's not there. Uh, which could cause the um, application the application supervisor to go down as well. So it's uh, it's just a, a limiter on putting up the web sockets. There's libraries for this kind of thing, but this is really kind of simple. I don't need to hold state on stuff and the application supervisor, which will bring you back up again, obviously. Um, so a slightly higher level. Um, the actual reason that the camera was uh, dropping off the network every so often was, turned out it was a bug in nervous networking at the time. Uh, and uh, when the, web, when the uh, network was up and down, occasionally it'd just forget what the connections were and it'd just give up. Um, so, and that's kind of scary coding though, and I didn't want to go and try and fix that stuff. So I wanted something which would detect that uh, and bring the nerves network down and bring it back up again, because killing the nerves network uh, I, on experimentation actually worked. It was a thing, it, 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 uh, it solved the issue. But there's two things here. We've got the, uh, the Wi-Fi application, which is responsible for setting up networking, and the server, server comms application, which is responsible for setting up sockets. And they're kind of related, but there's no re they should not know about each other. There are different levels on the stack, and it's, once you start jumping across these things, it's a, uh, it's a slippery slope to having everything intermingled and, no, and you don't know what on earth is going on in, in, in different bits of the code. Um, so how to solve that? Well, I stuck a network killer application in the middle, which uh, knows about knows about both the server comms and the Wi-Fi, and all it's responsible for is uh, taking the uh, the network down if server comms is out for a long time. Um, so we've got a server comms link, uh, linked to the binary socket wrapper, which you can find because it's a name process, and an assassin linked to the Wi-Fi wrapper, which you can also find because it's a name process. So stuff goes wrong, that dies, that dies, cascades down, that dies, but it's supervised, it all comes back, all comes back up again. Nothing's happened, but, but, we have, uh, we have this strategy here. If the socket goes down 15 times in two minutes, um, the, uh, the error cascades. So bang, bang, supervisor turns down, go, get taken down, supervisor chill, all the supervisors chill and go down, clues the assassin, that takes down the Wi-Fi wrapper, takes down the nose wet network, Everything's still supervised, comes up fresh and, and happy and connected to the network. And this gave us a system which didn't go down. Um, the only time these uh, uh, pies have gone down since then is when somebody's pulled the plug out for, for to uh, clean, put the vacuum cleaner in or the power went off over Christmas. Okay. Thanks. I was stopping for applause. I just forgot what I was doing, <laughs> but but thank you. Uh, there's another level over that, and that's the that's device robustness. Um, at the top level, we're, we're, I'm uh, looking to if everything's gone wrong, uh, let's reboot the device. And what we can use to reboot the device is. Heart, and I believe that uh, you know, the heart C Erlang uh, monitor thing, which will uh, check the health of your um, VM and uh, bring it up again, bring it down again when it when it when it's uh, when it's not so healthy. And I believe there's a fork here for nerves. Is that right? Yeah. And the fork uh, makes it made out of chocolate. I don't know. Is that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and with Heart, you get, uh, when you create a new Nose application these days, you get uh, this in the VM orgs uh, by default, which is a 30 second uh, heartbeat timeout. Um, I don't even time, good. 
Uh, so we need something. Well, this, uh, create a new gen server. It on in it it registers its module, the module for the gen server, with Hart to be the callback to tell to tell Hart whether the application is healthy or not. So we call it. So it's going to call the status function on Hart Health. Uh, and in this case, at this point, the status function, just have a call, it will always return OK. It's been configured with OK, it will always, it will always return OK. Uh, so, create, create a system down, which will cause it to return down. So, if we call system down, at some point in the next 30 seconds, Hart will call the, um, uh, the health. Uh, gen server, I'll get a down message and it will reboot the device. Uh, this is almost identical to the times out. It's a, it, I made it 10 minutes, it was just a random number, um, random time. Uh, if tick isn't called on heart trigger after within 10 minutes, uh, it'll, it'll call t uh, system down on heart, uh, and the next time the, um, maybe I've over used heart now, but the, the next time the, the heart uh, application so, uh, process calls in to the Erlang VM, uh, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll get down and it'll reboot. Tie it all together in a, its own little heart application. And put the application in shoehorn to make sure it's always there. Shoehorn uh, ensures that everything in there will be loaded, even if uh, other applications fail to load for whatever reason. Uh, then every time uh, the message is received, every time we get an act from the server, we can call heart trigger tick to tell heart trigger to tell tell heart we're still healthy. Uh, and as well as a times out tick at the lower level. Clearly, I've put that into its own function, but it's easy to bring it back up into that for a slide. Final piece, the outside of the union is the monitoring. Um, now there's, there's lots of options for monitoring, but kind of at the server level, let's just go with um, StatsD, Statics, Client for StatsD, and Datadog. Maybe, I hope there's nobody from AppSingle here, because I'm thinking maybe I should have done that. But anyway, StatsD, Datadog uh, for the monitoring. And like a, a cheap thing we can do is uh, on the server side, just uh, uh, call a counter every time an image is an image, image is received. Uh, at the very least, that gives us uh, an idea of um, the network health, for, and we can put alert, alerts on a particular camera, so we can be told when it's uh, struggling, when it's when it's going down. But I want it to be lovely. It would be just lovely if we could actually interest uh, have. Um, monitoring from inside the device itself. Well, with um, Fred Herbert's um, VM stats, you can. VM stats config, so this is on the device, VM stats config will uh, uh, configure it with a, a module called monitoring. Um, and we won't go mad, we'll just say, we'll monitor every every minute. and. Uh, I can't understand what the shed time wall stuff tells me anyway, so I've put that to false. Um, monitoring module, uh, aye, well, <laughs> okay, it's good. Uh, it prevents the VM stat sync behavior, and that just has one method collect with a, the type, which is uh, counter gauge timer of the, of the metric, a key and a value. Uh, we'll take that, bring it up to a tuple, uh, and um, use Elixir registry to dispatch it to anybody who's interested, um, and will will give us the opportunity to subscribe if you're interested. And who's interested? Well, the binary socket's interested. So uh, 
a financial hit can subscribe to the monitor to receive notification uh, every time some uh, uh, statistics available. Uh, WebSocket info um, uh, is a message to handle that and um, we just bring it up into uh, use Erlang tone to binary to uh, bundle it up and send it up the WebSocket with a, uh, on, the, on the same process. On the server side, on the image server, uh, just matching on uh, binary terms, they start with 131. Uh, images don't, they're like JPEGs, I think they start on, I don't know, FF? I can't remember. Um, so, and that's, that's the only term that's going to come up. So match on the 131, we know it's going to be a uh, um, some stats from the uh, from the device. We could be a bit. We could actually put a prefix in front of it if I could be bothered, but I can't. Um, get it back from uh, uh, into an Erlang term uh, using safe, just in case somebody sneaks in and tries to uh, overload all my uh, create loads of atoms. Um, then. Uh, we can send that up to Datadog or whatever we're using. Uh, that's the, the whatever monitoring tool we're using with the camera ID and the message. And then we've got we can make a dashboard per device we're using. Of course, if you've got thousands and thousands of um, consumer devices, you're not going to create a dashboard per device. But if you're if you've got three or four, two or three of them like we have, or if you've got uh, or if you're prototyping, I think this would be quite handy. And even if you've got thousands of consumer devices, it might be good to save some stats somewhere so you can see see what's happening on the on the VMs. So in summary, um, don't use convenient convenient abstractions like Phoenix channels uh, when they're no longer convenient. Uh, and quite often you find the layer under the abstraction isn't that hard to use anyway. Um, separation of concerns helps, it makes it easier to reason about the code uh, and isolate problems. Unit tests are great. Um, robustness, which I'm defining as um, not only being correct, but detecting failure conditions and uh, and self-healing when there's a failure condition. You can build the, that, those in at different levels. And monitoring can help detect and diagnose problems. Uh, red pandas. I'm done. There's red pandas. All right, I think we have some time for some questions. And just an enhancement too, yeah, the reason that we fork uh, uh, the uh, watchdog uh, for um, heart, for nerves, is that there's a hardware watchdog on the chip, and if Linux for some reason happens to fail, it'll actually reboot too, so. Nice. Uh, questions? Um, can't see, oh, hey, all right. <laughs> Cheers. You mentioned VM stat, and uh, I believe the Erlang virtual machine has SN, SNMP uh, protocol included. Is it what's it using, or is it completely different? And you're not concerned about that in Nerves SNMP protocol? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. It's just it's Fred's library, and I just plugged into it. <laughs> I just <laughs> it's good. So SNMP might be a good thing to plug in there as well if you wanted to be controlling and monitoring stuff. I think there's uh, also OSMON too, right? The, the OSMON library in Erlang, I think that provides some VM stats as well. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the VM stats uh, is, is kind of collects a set of them periodically, which is uh, just kind of convenient. Other questions? All right. Well, let's get another round of applause for Paul Wilson. Thank you.